In this week's Weekly Story Jokes, we bring you our best joke compilation of the week. These jokes are sure to make you laugh, from the first one to the last one. These are our story jokes which we love to generate. This week we bring you four jokes, starting with a joke about a body swap, until we end with a joke about corruption. So, sit back, get the popcorn, and get ready to laugh until your stomach ache. In our first joke of the day, we bring you an unhappy man who would like to swap with his wife. In today's cartoon story joke, we delve into the daily duties of men versus women. This hilarious joke will have you hanging from the trees with laughter. Okay, fellas, it's time to dust off those old caveman bragging rights. Science says you might be better at navigating than women, but hold on to your loincloths because it's not for the reason you might think. Apparently, us dudes are just better at using our inner compass. No, not that weird app you downloaded to impress your date, a real metaphorical compass. Scientists in Norway, because of course it was Norway, stuck a bunch of people in a virtual maze with 3D goggles and a joystick, basically turning them into video game avatars. After some epic joystick jousting, the researchers discovered that men were whizzing around the maze like Pac-Man on a sugar rush, while the women were more like, well, like most people trying to find the bathroom at an IKEA. So why the difference? The study suggests men rely on a world-centered strategy, which is basically like having an internal GPS that uses cardinal directions. Women, on the other hand, are more like walking sat-navs, relying on landmarks to get where they're going. Think of it this way. Men are all north, south, east, west, while women are all turn left at the giant troll statue, then go past the creepy talking cactus. The good news for the ladies is that this isn't some sexist, pre-programmed thing in your DNA. The study also showed that when women were given a dose of testosterone, their brain activity started to mimic the men's navigational strategy. So, fellas, if your girlfriend is giving you the gears about getting lost on the way to the grocery store, you can always offer to share your protein shake, assuming that's what gives the guys their inner compass. Of course, the researchers also point out that these differences might stem from our evolutionary past. Men were out hunting mammoths with their fancy spatial awareness, while women were busy gathering berries and remembering exactly where that perfect patch of blueberries was. So, the next time your significant other complains about your sense of direction, you can just point out that you're simply channeling your inner caveman and maybe offer to do the grocery shopping. But let's skip to the real brain bender. Are you tired of being the sole breadwinner? Feeling jealous of your wife's all-day nap schedule? This man's prayer request might just backfire in the funniest way possible. This man was sick and tired of going to work every day while his wife stayed home. He wanted his wife to experience what he must go through every day to bring home the money they needed to run their household. That night before he went to bed, he prayed to the Lord and said, Dear Lord, I go to work every day, work for eight hours nonstop while my wife stays at home. I would like her to know what I go through every day, so please allow us to change bodies for one day. This way, she will understand exactly why I am so tired at night. The next morning when he woke up, his prayers have been met. He woke up a woman, and his wife was now her husband. So please don't get confused here as this story progresses. He woke up much earlier than his husband and started to make breakfast so that his husband could be ready for work in time. He also woke the kids for breakfast, made sure they were all dressed up for school, and all their school books have been packed. He packed their lunches, drove them to school, came back home to get the dry cleaning, took it to the cleaners, stopped at the bank to make a deposit, went grocery shopping, then drove back home to unpack the groceries. Then he continues to make the beds, wash the dog, clean the cat's litter box, wash the laundry, vacuum the house, mop the kitchen floor, and clean the windows. Now it was time to rush back to school to fetch the kids, feed them as they got home, make sure they were busy with their homework, do the dishes, and start preparing supper. After supper, he once again cleaned the kitchen, did the dishes, folded the laundry, and bathed the kids. Now, 
it was time to do some ironing while watching TV with his husband. At 9 p.m. he was totally exhausted. While all his cores were not done yet, he decided to go to bed where he was expected to make love, which he managed to get through without complaining. The next morning, he woke up early and knelt next to bed to pray. Lord, I don't know what I was thinking. I was so wrong to envy my wife that stayed home all day. Please, oh please, can you change us back to how we were? The Lord then said, My son, I think you have learned your lesson, and I will be glad to change things back to the way things were. But you will have to wait for nine months, though, because you got pregnant last night. <laughs> In our second joke of the day, we bring you a doctor's wonderful advice. In today's cartoon story joke, we travel back in time to the toga-tactic world of ancient Rome. Forget grumpy husbands and water tricks, here's a whole different kind of marital mayhem. Imagine this, you're Julia, daughter of the mighty Emperor Augustus. Life's good, right? Palaces with golden plumbing, chariot rides with rock star centaurs delivering pizza. Wrong. Dad's a total buzzkill who insists you spend all day spinning wool like some kind of toga-wearing Rapunzel with a serious mommy issues complex and a sheep for a best friend. Here's the thing about Roman women. History basically ignored them. No voting, no writing, no leaving hilarious graffiti about politicians on public statues, which, let's be honest, would have been hilarious. But hey, at least they weren't stuck in a tower. Although being stuck in a palace with an interior designer who thinks the only acceptable color is sheep off white isn't much better. Imagine Augustus's idea of a slumber party, braiding competitions and mandatory bedtime stories about the history of wool production. Legally, things weren't peachy either. Dads ruled daughters, then husbands ruled wives. Talk about a control freak convention that would make even your grandma's bridge club look like a mosh pit. Thankfully, by the first century AD, some women got a break. They could manage their own businesses, buy fancy silk robes, because who wants to constantly shed like a molting poodle, and even become legally independent if they had three kids. Three kids like some kind of weird Roman PTA membership perk that came with a complimentary minivan and a lifetime supply of juice boxes. Most women, though, were stuck spinning and weaving. You'd think an emperor's daughter could get out of that, right? Wrong. Enter Julia, the firecracker princess with a wanderlust for something other than a never-ending supply of yarn. She wasn't exactly your typical toga-clad Penelope, waiting for Odysseus to get lost at sea again. Let's just picture a Roman Cleopatra, except with a library of scandalous gossip instead of ASP jokes, and a strategically placed toga strap malfunction that would make even Julius Caesar do a double take, and maybe blush a little. Of course, Dad Augustus, the ultimate party pooper, who probably invented mandatory toga wearing just to make his daughter miserable, did not find this amusing. He banished Julia faster than you can say, gladiator fight. Moral of the story, even emperor's daughters couldn't break the rules, especially the ones about itchy wool and public displays of non-wifely behavior that would make even a toga-clad Venus blush. So next time you're stuck doing chores, remember Julia, at least you don't have to pretend to be the perfect wife while rocking a serious case of yarn-induced boredom. Unless, of course, your boss is secretly a time-traveling Augustus with a hidden stash of wool and a surprising lack of chill, and a pet goose that keeps hissing at you in Latin. In the chaotic circus of Roman life, keeping your loved ones calm wasn't exactly a walk in the toga park. Here's a guide, guaranteed to confuse more than soothe, but hopefully tickle your funny bone. For the frazzled Roman lady, here is a couple of things that had to be considered. First, there was the bath time with Bacchus, wine god, not the neighbor's goat. Picture Cleopatra, but instead of fancy oils, fill the tub with leftover grape juice, because who can afford real wine after those Roman taxes? Throw in some rose petals for ambiance, and maybe a rubber ducky for good measure. Secondly, there was the gossip gladiators. Is your wifey throwing a toga tantrum? 
ditch the chamomile tea and essential oils. Let her vent about the latest palace scandals involving toga malfunctions and chariot crashes that would make reality TV blush. If that fails, rent out a mini coliseum for a private gladiator show. There's nothing like a thumbs down from Caesar's wife, or should we say, thumbs maybe this guy needs a new career, to put some pep in her step. And last for the ladies were the black market bonanza. Roman law meant most women couldn't own businesses. So unleash your inner rogue and take your sweetheart on a thrilling shopping spree through the forbidden black market. Just be prepared to outrun the toga police and maybe a goose or two if you snag that illegal silk robe she's been eyeing. Now, for the stressed Roman dude, here is what had to be considered. First, there was meat, topia, not mushy mush. Forget those wimpy bowls of barley. A real Roman man craves a feast fit for a gladiator. Think roasted boar the size of a small dacia, mountains of grapes that would make Bacchus jealous, and enough bread to soak up the inevitable wine spillage, because toga cleaning is a nightmare. Second for the guys were chariot chaos, or fistfight fun time. Channel your inner Julius Caesar and drag your buddy to the chariot races. Bonus points if you bribe a charioteer to nearly wipe out spectacularly. Don't worry, it's all part of the entertainment. If fistfights are more his thing, well, a good old-fashioned brawl might be just the stress reliever he needs. Just make sure it's pre-arranged and nobody loses an eye. Those things are expensive to replace. Then lastly, the guys indulged in some wine wisdom, the drunken debate. Roman men loved a good philosophical discussion. So, for a truly unforgettable night, engage your buddy in a deep debate about the merits of various toga styles. Or, to get the real party started, see who can drink the most wine without falling asleep first. Loser buys the next round of chariot tickets and the hangover medicine. Just remember, this is all meant to be a laugh. Calming people down in Roman times was probably a lot trickier than this. But hey, at least you'll be the most confused, toga-clad person in the room. Now buckle up, history lovers, because we're about to get a whole lot less factual and a whole lot funnier. A woman bursts into the doctor's office, practically dragging her husband behind her. He's fuming, muttering under his breath, and looks like a teapot about to explode. The woman throws her hands up in exasperation. Doctor, she pleads, you have to help. My husband loses his temper at the drop of a hat. One minute he's fine, the next he's ready to launch into a volcanic eruption. The doctor, a man who'd seen it all, or at least most of it, calmly adjusts his spectacles. Hmm, this sounds like a case of the marital meltdowns. Tell you what, he says, turning to the husband who's now resembling a simmering pot. Why don't you wait outside? I need to have a private word with your wife. The husband throws the doctor a withering look, but eventually stomps out, muttering something about shrink tactics. Once alone with the frazzled woman, the doctor leans forward conspiratorially. All right, here's the secret weapon. When you feel your husband's about to erupt like Mount Vesuvius, grab a glass of water, swish it around in your mouth, nice and vigorously. Don't swallow it. Just keep it swishing. The woman blinks, a little confused. But doctor, how will that help? The doctor winks. Don't worry, you will see, and then we will talk again. Two weeks later, the woman bursts back into the doctor's office, practically skipping with glee. Her husband trails behind, sporting an expression like a kicked puppy who just discovered a hidden stash of steak bones. Doctor, it worked she beams. Every time my husband started to lose it, I'd grab a glass of water and swish, swish, swish. He calmed right down every single time. That was the most brilliant idea. But how does just a water do that? The doctor winks. The water itself doesn't matter, my dear. It's keeping your mouth shut that does the trick. Our third joke of the day is a story about the magnificent Baron von Munchausen. In today's cartoon story joke, we bring you the infamous Baron von Munchausen. Baron Munchausen is a fascinating figure, 
blurring the lines between reality and outrageous fiction. Here's the story. First, there was the true soldier with a flair for the dramatic. Yes, here was a real baron, Hieronymus Karl Friedrich von Munchausen, a German nobleman who served in the Russian military during the 18th century. He was known for being a bit of a braggart, telling tall tales about his adventures. These stories likely stemmed from his actual experiences, but were embellished for dramatic effect. However, the Baron Munchausen we know today is primarily a fictional character. A writer named Rudolf Erich Raspe took the real Baron's tales and spun them into a wild and wacky collection of stories titled Baron Munchausen's Narrative of His Marvelous Travels and Campaigns in Russia, published in 1785. These stories were wildly popular and introduced the world to the outrageous exploits of the fictional Baron Munchausen. Now, The Adventures of the Baron is where logic goes on vacation. The fictional Baron is a notorious exaggerator. His adventures involve him riding cannonballs, pulling himself out of a swamp by his own hair, and even traveling to the moon, where his horse got stuck. These stories are filled with absurdity and humor, with the Baron always emerging victorious, no matter how impossible the situation. The character of Baron Munchausen has become synonymous with tall tales and outlandish stories. He's inspired countless books, movies, and even a term, Munchausen Syndrome, a psychological condition where people fabricate stories about themselves. So, is Baron Munchausen real? A bit of both. The real Baron provided the seed, but the fictional Baron, with his incredible feats and wild imagination, is the one who truly captured the world's attention. Let's buckle down in our own story as this magnificent Superman of the 18th century. Ah, the bustling city of London, where fog hung heavy and social media buzzed like a hive of overstimulated bumblebees. Now, Baron Munchausen, a man never one to shy away from an adventure, found himself particularly intrigued by this phenomenon. Social media, you say? boomed the Baron, his voice echoing in the opulent drawing room. A place where one can broadcast their every thought and pastry to the entire world? Preposterous. Lady Fitzwilliam, a society matron with a fondness for gossip columns, adjusted her monocle. Indeed, Baron, it's quite the rage. People curate their lives, share their opinions, and chase those elusive likes. Intrigued, the Baron declared, then I, Baron Munchausen, shall embark on a most daring expedition. I shall infiltrate this social media and conquer it with the sheer brilliance of my tales. The next morning, with the help of a particularly tech-savvy footman, it seems even the most outlandish adventures required some modern assistance, the Baron established his online presence. Now, choosing a profile picture was paramount, a fierce duel with a yeti? Too common. Riding a hot air balloon powered by sneezing penguins? Slightly unrefined. Finally, a picture of the Baron, astride a cannonball mid-flight, a triumphant grin on his face, was deemed perfect. The Baron, ever the showman, crafted his first post. Greetings, fellow netizens, it began. I, Baron Munchausen, have arrived in the digital realm prepared to be astonished by tales of my extraordinary exploits. He then proceeded to narrate his daring escape from a kraken in the Arctic, using a narwhal's horn as a toothpick. The internet, a place where the bizarre thrives, erupted. The Baron's post went viral faster than a runaway carriage. People were captivated. Was he a madman? A genius? A historical figure with a time machine? The comments section was a battlefield of speculation. Emboldened by his newfound fame, the Baron continued his digital rampage. He recounted his adventures in the lost city of Atlantis, reached by submarine powered by pickled onions, his duel with a fire-breathing dragon defeated with a bucket of tea, and his escape from a tribe of head-hunting cannibals who were so impressed by his stories they let him go. However, the Baron, a man accustomed to more tangible audiences, missed a crucial detail. 
the internet never forgets. One particularly eagle-eyed netizen noticed a glaring inconsistency. The Baron, in his tale of escaping the cannibals, mentioned wearing a cravat made from the finest Amazonian spider silk. However, in a previous post, detailing his encounter with a tribe of hat-wearing penguins, the Baron clearly sported a polka-dotted cravat. The internet, with the swiftness of a hungry piranha, pounced. The Baron was exposed as a fraud, a master fabricator, a purveyor of tall tales. His followers, feeling duped, unfollowed him faster than a cockroach flees the light. The Baron's once thriving social media presence became a desolate wasteland, tumbleweeds of forgotten comments rolling through the digital desert. The Baron, crestfallen, sat at his computer, staring at the screen. Lady Fitzwilliam patted his shoulder sympathetically. There, there, Baron. Social media is a fickle beast. Perhaps stick to the traditional drawing room for your tales. The Baron, a glint back in his eye, chuckled. Fear not, dear lady. I may have lost the battle, but the war is far from over. After all, who knows? Perhaps one day I shall conquer this social media with the most outrageous story of all. And so the Baron, forever undeterred, retreated to plan his next escapade. One thing was certain, the internet wouldn't forget him anytime soon. After all, a good tall tale, even exposed, always leaves a mark. <laughs> In our last funny story of today, we bring you some history around corruption and the way it's playing itself out today. In today's cartoon story joke, we delve into the age-old sport of corruption. Oh yes, corruption, a hilariously tragic tale throughout time. Corruption, it's plagued us since the dawn of time, like a stubborn barnacle on the ship of civilization. In ancient Greece, getting ahead meant bribing politicians with the latest olive oil and fanciest togas. It was considered rude to show up empty-handed, Imagine politicians complaining about fruit baskets today. Forward to the Roman Empire, here, corruption was like a delicious yet slightly moldy pizza. Everyone knew it was there, but they kept eating it anyway. Julius Caesar basically used a giant golden pizza cutter to bribe his way to power. Then there was the Middle Ages, where corruption was a bit more complex. Corruption wasn't a single villain. It was a whole monster with tentacles of greed, laziness, and a surprising fondness for loot music. Then came the Ottomans. They tried to outsmart corruption by constantly shuffling officials around, like a shell game with bureaucrats. But guess what? Corruption always found the pea, and probably ate it. Fast forward to the 20th century, where corruption went global, like a bad pop song. From shady oil deals to politicians with offshore bank accounts fatter than Santa's sack, it seems like some people just can't resist lining their pockets. The worst part? Corruption hurts the poor the most. It's like stealing candy from a baby. Except the candy is a good education and health care. But there's hope. We can fight corruption with the power of education. By teaching people the difference between right and wrong we can make bribes as unappealing as Brussels sprouts. So, there you have it, folks. Corruption, a hilarious, if you have a dark sense of humor, and tragic story. But together, we can write a new ending. Now that we understand the origins of this favorite sport, being played my men in power and men with power, let's knuckle down to a hilarious joke in the way it is playing out today in modern society. Apparently, Chicago is the most corrupt city in the USA, so let's play it in their court. This government tender went out to build a new city library in the center of, you guess it, Chicago. One of the tender prerequisites was that the tender board interview all the companies that qualify for the job once their tenders were ready. Two of the tender board's members will be present at these meetings. So, the first qualifying company was from the city of Detroit, and was invited to come and explain their tender to the two tender board members. The company brought a team of engineers to explain their design, safety procedures, construction timeline, and many technical details. They also brought their finance manager to explain their costing model to the team. 
Our tender is for $2 million, of which $1 million is for all materials and logistics. $800,000 is for labor, and $200,000 is profit for the company's shareholders. The two tender board members were happy with their explanation. So, the second qualifying company was from the city of Cincinnati and was invited to come and explain their tender to the two tender board members. The company once again brought a team of engineers to explain their design, safety procedures, construction timeline, and many technical details. They also brought their finance manager to explain their costing model to the team. Our tender is for $1 million, of which $500,000 is for all materials and logistics, $400,000 is for labor, and $100,000 is profit for the company's shareholders. The two tender board members were also happy with their explanation. So, the last qualifying company was from the city of Chicago, the hometown of the new project, and was invited to come and explain their tender to the two tender board members. The CEO of the company arrived on his own, without anything for the presentation. He walked in and sat down. The board said, so can you explain your tender to us, please? The CEO of the Chicago company said, my price for the job is for $4 million. And that was all he said. The two tender board members were not very impressed with this proposed costing. So they asked him to explain how he got to the proposed price for the erection of the library. It's simple math, the CEO said, as there are two of you, me, and a construction company. It is one million for each one of you two tender board members, a million dollars for me, and a million dollars for those fools from Cincinnati. <laughs> if you liked our joke, then please watch our next joke by clicking here. <laughs>